Thank you. Oh, my apologies. Okay. I missed you. No worries. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. All right. It looks like your video is connecting and you're there. Perfect. And I apologize ahead of time because I'm not actually able to see everyone's um, faces from my screen. So um, if we're missing anyone, just let me know. Or if I, if I don't notice anyone either. It is two o'clock, so we'll, we'll get started. Welcome to the April 11th, 2024 Legislation and Regulation Committee. Uh, my name is Jesse Crowley, chairperson of the committee. Before we convene, I would like to remind everyone present that the board is a consumer protection agency charged with administering and enforcing pharmacy law, where protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted. The protection of the public shall be paramount. As I facilitate this meeting, I will announce when we are accepting public comment. I have advised the meeting moderator to allot three minutes to each individual providing comments. We will begin with the public comments for individuals attending in person, followed by public comments by individuals participating via WebEx. Um, and just to confirm, do we have any uh, public members present in Sacramento? There are no members of the public in Sacramento. Can you hear me? This is Anne. There are no members of the public in Sacramento. All right, thank you. One moment. I'm actually a little having a little trouble with my audio, so let me see if I can fix that. Got it. Great. Thank you, Anne. Um, so this approach is necessary to facilitate the meeting. Before we get started, I would i uh, like to ask staff moderating the meeting to provide general instructions on the process for providing public comments via WebEx. Absolutely. When the time comes for public comment, we are going to ask people to raise their hands virtually. You can do that by tapping the hand button at the bottom of the screen. For our dial-in users, you'll need to dial star 3 in order to raise a hand. For our mobile device users, you will have three different screens and only one of them has a hand button. So you may need to hit the ellipses button. That's the dot, dot, dot at the bottom in order to find the appropriate page with your hand button. Um, in the lower right hand corner of the screen for our desktop users and for and maybe even for our mobile users, we have a Q&A box where you can type the word comment if you'd like uh, to request your time to comment that way. As stated, you'll be given three minutes to speak, and I'll give you a 10-second warning before your time expires. Madam Chair? Thank you so much. Um, I would now like to take a roll call to establish a quorum. Trevor Chandler? Here. Thank you. Jose De La Paz? Public member present. Thank you. KK Joss? Licensee member present. Thank you. Uh, Maria Serpa. Licensee member present. Thank you. Nicole Tebow. Licensee member present. Thank you. And Jesse Crowley, I'm here. A quorum has been established. Members, we have a full agenda for our meeting today. I ask everyone participating today to be respectful of the work before the committee. We encourage participation by members of the public throughout our meetings at appropriate times. The committee respectfully requests that when comments are provided, they are done so in a professional manner consistent with how the committee conducts its business. Finally, before we move to the next agenda item, I would like to remind committee members participating via WebEx to please remain visible on camera throughout the open portion of today's meeting. Members, if you need to temporarily turn off your camera due to challenges with internet connectivity, Please remember to announce the reason for your non appearance when you turn off your camera. Moving on to agenda item 2 public comments. I will now ask the moderator to open the line for individuals to provide opportunity to provide public comments. You are not required to identify yourself, but may do so. Um, this is for items not on the agenda or agendas for future items. 
I'd like to remind everyone that the committee cannot take action on these items except to decide whether to place them on a future agenda. Members, following the review of the comments for this agenda item, I will ask if um, anyone has a comment and if they believe anything should be placed on a future agenda. As a reminder, this agenda item is not intended to be a discussion, but rather an opportunity for members of the committee and members of the public to request consideration of an item for future placement on agenda, at which time discussion may occur. Are there any members of, oh, sorry, we already said that there are no members of the public in Sacramento. So moderator, we're ready for public comment from individuals participating via WebEx. We are now open for public comment via WebEx for items not on the agenda. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in user style star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And as a reminder for our mobile device users, while we're waiting for comment, you may need to hit the ellipses button. That's the dot, dot, dot at the bottom if you're having trouble finding a hand button. We also have the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner where you may type the word comment if you'd like to make a comment. We're going to give it just a few more seconds before we continue. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the agenda? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh... So moving on to the next agenda item, approval of the July 18th, 2023 committee meeting minutes. Members, as we begin our consideration, I'll ask if anyone has any questions or comments on the draft minutes from the July 18th, 2023 meeting. I would also entertain a motion if you believe such action is appropriate. Motion to approve. Thank you, Jose. Second. Thank you. So we, with a motion and a second on the floor, um, we will now open the line for public comment. All right. We are taking public comment via WebEx. I believe we do not have anyone in person uh, in Sacramento. So please raise a hand if you'd like to make a comment via WebEx. Tap that hand button at the bottom of the screen. And for our dial-in users, please dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the motion? Uh, yes, we will move on to a roll call vote. Trevor, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Thank you. Jose? Yes. Thank you. KK? Yes. Thank you. Maria? Yes. Thank you. Nicole? Yes. Thank you. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Moving on to the next agenda item, discussion and consideration of pending legislation impacting the practice of pharmacy, the board's jurisdiction, or board operations. Members, there are a number of measures included on the agenda today for our discussion. The last day for policy committees to consider a bill with fiscals is April 26th, and the last day for policy committees to hear bills without a fiscal is May 3rd. I highlight this because there are some measures that we consider today that may not need to discuss during the board meeting later this month if the measure includes a fiscal but was not scheduled for a hearing. Also, while discussing each of these proposals, unless the board already has a position established, I will be requesting a motion to establish a position if members believe such action is appropriate. Where the board has established a position, it was done through the delegated authority of the president. I will highlight those measures as well. Members, do you have any questions or comments before we proceed? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to the first item, Assembly Bill 82 Weber Dietary Supplements for Weight Loss and Over-the-Counter Diet. This first measure for consideration is AB 82. The measure would prohibit a retail establishment from selling dietary supplements for weight loss or over-the-counter diet pills to any person under 18 years old of age without a prescription. The measure would also require the State Department of Public Health to develop a notice for distribu distribution and posting describing some of the possible side effects of taking such product products 
and will require the California Department of Public Health to consult with the FDA and other stakeholders to determine which dietary supplements and weight loss OTC diet pills will be subject to this section. This establishes a July 1st, 2024 effective date. I note a potential increase in establishment seeking licensure as a pharmacy. Further staff are not recommending a position on this measure, and I believe this may be appropriate to monitor, but I don't believe a position is necessary. Members, I welcome your thoughts on this measure. Hi, Jesse, this is Nicole. I agree with taking a watch position for now. I feel like we kind of need more information. Thank you, Nicole. Chelsea, um, this is Maria. Um, I just wanted to confirm that Nicole is suggesting a watch position, whereas the staff is saying no position. Those are two different um, stances. Okay. Apologies, I can say I can say a no position. Um, we can stick with what the staff recommended. Thank you. I personally I just... want to watch it further. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so I believe, I guess I will need to double check if we're not actually taking a position. Do we actually need a motion? Jesse, sorry, I, I'm not quite sure it's working in this room. A motion is not required unless the board wishes to establish a position or the committee. Great. Thank you. Anne. Are there any other member comments? Hearing none, and since there is no motion that's required, we can open the line for uh, public comment. We are open for public comment via WebEx. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the agenda? Yes, please. Thank you. Moving on to the next agenda item, Assembly Bill 1842 Reyes Health Care Coverage Medication Assisted Treatment. This bill would prohibit a healthcare service plan or health insurer from requiring a prior authorization or step therapy for a naloxone or other opioid antag antagonist approved by the FDA or a buprenorphine or long acting injectable naltrexone for detoxification or maintenance treatment of a substance use disorder. Staff are recommending a support position on this measure and note that the board has a long history of supporting measures that facilitate better access to naloxone and other medication assisted treatments. I agree with the staff recommendation. Members, as I open up for discussion on AB 1842, I would also entertain a motion, including perhaps a recommendation to the board to establish a support position on AB 1842. Members, do you have any comments? Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Chandler. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I believe we should continue the board's uh, strong uh, position in supporting this. This is one of um, the opioid epidemic is one of the largest medical issues of our time, potentially even larger than COVID and shows no sign of slowing down. And we need to empower pharmacists to be able uh, to utilize every single tool at their disposal and this bill would help do just that. And so I would move that the board take a position of support on assembly bill 1842. Great, thank you for the motion, Trevor. And no further comments, I think Trevor covered it well. I'll second that. Great, thank you. With the motion and second on the floor. If there's no other member comments, I can open up uh, for public comment via WebEx. We are open for public comment via WebEx. If you'd like to make a comment on the motion, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen.
dial in users dial star 3 to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And as a reminder for our mobile device users, if you're having trouble finding that hand button, please tap the ellipses button. That's the dot 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 at the bottom of your screen. We're going to take just a few seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the motion? Yes, please. Thank you. I will now bring the discussion back to members um, and take a roll call vote. Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Jose, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. KK, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Maria, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Nicole, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, and I vote yes, the motion passes. Assembly Bill 1902, Prescription Drug Labels and Accessibility. Members, AB 1902 would require pharmacies to provide translated directions for use on prescription labels under specified conditions, and further would require a pharmacy to provide a person at no additional cost an accessible prescription label that among other conditions, is appropriate to the disability and language of the person making the request through use of audio or audible large print braille or translated labels. As amended, this measure would not apply if the dispenser is a veterinarian. Staff are not offering a recommendation on this measure. I agree with the staff comment that the policy goals of this measure are laudable and share concerns about the practical implications and of implementing implementation. Members, I recommend that the board monitor this legislation. I believe this may be an appropriate measure to monitor, but I do not believe a position is necessary. Members, I welcome your thoughts. I think I agree. Yeah. It, it does require a little bit more information and especially the practical implementation part, especially some of the requirements and looking at the pharmacy side of things uh, is quite challenging, but again, it is something very necessary. So I'd like to see what more development happens in this field. So sorry, Nicole. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, I was going to say, I think this is like a wonderful what we're going for with this. I don't know if it actually exists, the technology. So can we find out if it does and then <laughs> Maybe like, what is the cost? Because like, if this is really cost prohibitive to pharmacies, I don't know if it's possible. The other thing I want to flag if this does go through is it becomes quite tricky. You have to fully trust that the translation or or the the Braille, the different version is correct if you yourself can't read it. So what happens if there's an error in the translation? Um, is the pharmacist liable for that? So I think there, there's a piece to that, that if this looks like it's going to go through, we would probably want to in some way account for if there's an error with the technology and the person, you know, can't read that language or can't understand it, the, the label. So Nicole, the, I don't know about the Braille and that'll be something new, but as far as language to language translation modules are concerned, I think I have seen programs that can give you printout in up to 23 languages, including non Latin alphabets. So, you know, Chinese or other languages that uses different alphabets. So, technologically, yes, that is quite available. It's actually in use also yeah, in, in many parts of the California. Uh, I personally don't know about the Braille, and that's why I wanted to know more about what development can happen. So I, I can, I definitely support the position of taking none. Yeah, I was thinking of the Braille as well. Yes, I know the language translation is available, but also for, um, it sounds like there's also technology around, like, that it, it's like spoken, if I'm reading this right, that like you scan it and it, it's spoken and the, the braille in that piece, I don't know. Um, and then with the languages though, I've seen where the translation is wrong. Um, and that makes me really concerned if you don't speak the language and you can't verify that it's correct and what happens if there's an error. So overall, I like the concept, but we, I feel like we need more information. 
I, I think, um, I believe that Braille technology does exist. I actually have had a blind patient request that. Um, and at the pharmacy I was working at, we weren't able to accommodate the patient because it was so cost prohibitive. Um, and so I think that's something that we would need more information on. I think the intention is amazing and we need to figure out a way so that uh, patients with disabilities are able to access their medications, understand them correctly, and receive consultation. Um, if there was a way for this to be uh, a cost, maybe not on the pharmacy individually, I think that would be a, a good discussion to have. Um, but practically speaking, the, the cost, the implementation, I, I'm not sure. And that, that's kind of, I think, where staff was concerned as well. Jesse? Yeah. Maria, one uh, different comment is um, I, when I looked at the bill language also, it didn't explain the term in a language made available to the board or the phrase. Um, what that exactly means, um, and so in watch and, and uh, monitoring where this bill goes is keeping in mind how we would operationalize it as a board. Is um, make in a language available to the board mean that the record would have both the English um, SIG, for example, and the um, the non-English SIG uh, in the record, so that uh, inspector could look at both of them in the future. Or does it mean that anytime this happens, that the board needs to be notified? I think it's just not very clear what that phrase means. And so operationalizing it, I just don't want um, unintended consequences to the board or to pharmacies. Agreed. Uh, Jesse, I have a question. I know what we're looking for here is, you know, support, oppose those kind of positions, but um, and you may not know the answer. This might be an and question. Is there any room for the board to engage with the author's office to find out what they're looking for with the language and also like kind of talking through some of the limitations? Like if this is cost prohibitive to pharmacies, you know, are they willing to have exemptions for non chain pharmacies or, you know, some, something like that? Um, can, are we allowed to engage with the author's office? That's a good question. Um, Anne, would you be able to provide some insight on that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I would say, Nicole, yes, staff can always engage um, with the author's office. Um, if this is an example of a measure that you'd like staff to do so, happy to engage. Um, learn a little bit more about um, the policy goals and see if from a technical standpoint, staff could provide some suggestions on how they could potentially still meet the policy goals, um, but maybe in a different fashion or maybe um, through a step approach, if that's helpful information. That is, thank you, Anne. So with that, I'm going to make a motion that Board of Pharmacy staff engage with the author's office to um, follow up on the, the things that we've discussed. Can I motion that? <laughs> is that allowed? <laughs> So, Nicole, do we need welcome, a motion for that? Anne? Yeah, I was going to say you're welcome to make a motion, but I, I don't, I don't need a motion necessarily to go and engage with the author's office. That's true because we're not taking a position. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so it sounds like we have a consensus uh, to just not have a position, and it sounds like to, is everyone okay with that? And not hearing any additional comment, moderator, we're ready for public comment via WebEx. All right, we are open for public comment via WebEx. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And it looks like our first request is coming from Stephen Gray in the Q&A box. Hold on just a moment, Stephen. We're going to send you a request to, un to unmute your microphone. You'll be given three minutes to speak, and I'll give you a 10-second warning before your time expires. Uh, just some background information that the board um, members should know. Um, this is an, a long-standing issue that the board has faced before, and uh, and the profession has faced before. Uh, the first facing of it was in what is called the UNRU Act, which is the California version of the Americans with Disability Act and also with the Americans with Disability Act. 
regarding the Braille, uh, the Americans with Disability Act <clears throat> requires uh, making a reasonable accommodation. And in some cases, they have already opined that uh, providing Braille information is reasonable for healthcare providers. And there are organizations that already do this, uh, including pharmacy organizations. Uh, there is, for an example, uh, you can send an electronic message to a, a business in Oregon, and with uh, by 10 o'clock the next day, it will be back to the patient, all translated into uh, Braille. And that can be the directions for use. It can be the patient handout. It can be anything you want. Uh, I don't know the cost of that. I know that at one time uh, it was considered cost prohibitive, uh, but on the other hand, um, one of the options was to uh, make this um, uh, turn the law and if it's cost prohibitive for a pharmacy that's filling a prescription, it, to me that's quite understandable, uh, but you could make the healthcare provider provide this information. Many healthcare providers already have to provide such assistance uh, for uh, doctor's office visits, hospital discharge instructions, uh, et cetera. So that's one option you might want to uh, have a discussion with the author about uh, cost prohibitive for pharmacy, but there are other options, including requiring the uh, coverage uh, person to pay for uh, that part of the care. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. That was our only request for comment. Great. We can move on. Um, and since there's no motion on the floor, we'll move to the next agenda item. Uh, the next agenda item is Assembly Bill 2115, Haney Controlled Substances. As amended, this bill would authorize a nonprofit or free, uh, free clinic to dispense a Schedule II controlled substance for the purpose of relieving acute withdrawal symptoms while arrangements are being made for referral to treatment. The measure would make would also make changes to narcotic treatment programs. This measure was recently scheduled for hearing during the Assembly Business, Business and Professions Committee hearing on April 16, 2024. President O, through his delegated authority, recently established a support position and offered technical amendments. It is my understanding the offer's office accepted the board's technical amendments. I agree that a support position for this measure is appropriate. As I open up for discussion, I want to ensure that members received the comment in advance of this meeting that was written. Um, and while I appreciate the comment, I believe the intent of this legislation will allow for dispensing at a clinic. I believe the technical amendment offered by the board addresses the issue raised by the commenter. Members, I welcome your thoughts on this measure as well as your thoughts on the board's current position on it. Nancy, this is Maria. Yeah. And um, first of all, I wanted to show my appreciation to staff who put links in our um, chair report or committee report that allow me to easily read the actual bill. And so I found it uh, helpful to read the uh, bill language itself to see that this is not a big change. They currently have the ability to um, provide controlled substances. It just adds more detail on the monitoring and some of the specifics that are on page five of the of our summary, but it's not changing the practice of providing. It's just adding some um, clarity and some guardrails around the how. So I agree with the support position. Great, thank you, Maria. I see. I just want to well, again restate. I think anything that uh, helps address the opioid epidemic in every single facet is something that the board should support because there's going to be no silver bullet for any of these. And um, this is a, another tool in the toolkit to make sure that we're doing everything possible. So I appreciate President O uh, putting the board's approval on this and um, him and the and staff providing technical amendments to make it even better. I think it just shows how how valuable the Board of Pharmacy is in these conversations. And um, I also uh, support the support position. Great. Thank you, Trevor. Any other member comments? Hearing none, uh, moderator, we can open the lines for public comments via WebEx. All right, we are open for public comment via WebEx, this time on 4D. 
If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star 3 to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And it looks like Keith Yosh Yoshizuka has requested in the Q&A box. Hold on, Keith. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. I'm not sure if it was my comment that was addressed uh, previously, but um, I have concerns with the language and wording of the bill. Um, currently, um, pharmacists and prescribers may dispense. Um, a clinic is not a person. So, uh, a clinic may not prescribe. In order to dispense, uh, both California law and federal law require to have a legitimate prescription for a controlled substance. Um, for a prescriber dispensing, it is inferred that that prescription exists because the prescriber has the authority to prescribe, uh, but the uh, pharmacist uh, pharmacy must have the the uh, bona fide prescription. So the language of the bill says that the clinic may dispense. So one, there has to be a prescription from a prescriber. Um, even if the prescriber is not on site, uh, I think um, the pandemic has loosened up the requirement for a um, um, prescriber do you do a good faith uh, physical exam as required by Ryan's law um, th this can be accomplished by you know video video meeting or something like that um, but once that prescription is established who in the clinic is going to be filling the prescription uh, I don't believe there's normally a pharmacist there so somebody else is going to be filling the prescription or is the intent to just dispense it without a prescription. And I fear that that would create a uh, bad precedent for dispensing without a prescription, because if we keep the same definition, that means a licensed pharmacy could dispense a Schedule II controlled substance without a prescription. Um, so I think the language needs to be cleaned up. I would much prefer uh, having uh, to, to keep the uh, language consistent with everything else that's on the books and say that the prescriber uh, may dispense um, and make it consistent with the federal law. And if you Google um, three-day supply, uh, there it bring, it'll bring you to the, to the federal register and give you the um, the um, federal requirements uh, that you know for the DEA regulations. And for a new patient, I believe that's restricted to uh, 24 hours as opposed to 72 hours for a patient. 10 seconds. Been... Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for your comments. Next, we're gonna hear from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment. We're sending you a request to unmute your microphone. <clears throat> Thank you again. Um, I also agree with uh, uh, Keith, uh, the previous speaker. Um, it needs to be clarified who's going to be due the dispensing and what the situation is. The other thing that needs to be clarified is uh, this dispensing have to be reported to the cures program. Um, that's something. Is it uh, come under Ryan's Act, which is federal law? There has to be a good faith in person or an acceptable uh, video confirmation of the identity of the patient. Um, sometimes the uh, there may be a prescriber on duty. Uh, sometimes there's a nurse practitioner who is a prescriber under law. There even theoretically could be a pharmacist who's a prescriber. But in some cases, there aren't any prescribers actually on duty, uh, maybe when this needs to be done, uh, although that is rare. And uh, it may be the intention of the author to allow a nurse a registered nurse to dispense. Law was changed a few years ago 
uh, specifically in the Nurse Practice Act, not in the pharmacy law, to allow a clinic, a licensed clinic RN to dispense prescription drugs that were ordered by a prescriber uh, related to the clinic. However, it specifically excludes all controlled substances. So uh, there are several things that need to be uh, clarified. And one way to start is what uh, Keith recommended is to Google this program. The DEA actually came out with this idea of a three day supply to cover a transition period while the patient is under withdrawal symptoms until you could get them into a program. The goal here, for an example, if of that law was to, or this law was to cover methadone, but this law doesn't all, uh, methadone is not a schedule two, uh, is a schedule two item, but buprenorphine under California Controlled Substance Act is actually a schedule five, and under federal law, it's a schedule three. So even uh, which products that you're trying to cover the withdrawal symptom in, uh, de depending on what they're addicted to, uh, needs to be clarified. So I think there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done between experts in pharmacy and the author's office and the goal of the sponsor, which I believe is the city county of San Francisco, uh, to get this uh, in a good form, even though I completely agree with what the DA, uh, uh, the DEA is trying to do with its new uh, 2023 uh, three-day supply rule, which I would again suggest that you uh, Google and, and really read it. It's very well done. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And we're going to take a last look around. That was our last request for comment. Great. Um, so those were two really good comments. Members, do you want to add anything additional to the comments that we just heard? I will just note that I, I can see um, and understand where some of the confusion comes from. Um, specifically with the language saying that a clinic may dispense and maybe we can work with the doctor's office, uh, or I'm sorry, the author's office in regards to clarifying um, the personnel who can actually handle and uh, administer or dispense these medications. I think this is an important step forward though for access particularly to methadone. That's been a huge barrier for substance, uh, the treatment of substance use disorder. And um, I still think a support position is really important in this case. Um, and if there are no additional member comments, um, since the president has already established um, a support position, we don't need a motion. Um, are there any other final comments from members? Great. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, Assembly Bill 2169, prescription drug coverage dose adjustments. The next measure for our consideration is AB 12, 2169, which would allow a healthcare professional to request authority to adjust the dose or frequency of a drug to meet specific medical needs of the enrollee without prior authorization under specified conditions, including that the dose has not been adjusted more than two times without prior authorization. I agree with the staff recommendation to establish a support position. Members, I welcome your thoughts and would also entertain a motion to recommend establishing a position on the measure if you believe a, an action is appropriate. Hi, Jesse, this is Nicole. I would move to, uh, I would motion to recommend a support position. Great, thank you, Nicole. I just need some clarity about healthcare professional and will how are we defining here and, and again like i did not read the original bill as maria did uh, but uh, if if that clarity is available be great uh, are we talking about prescribers agent also as a healthcare professional or truly the people with uh, prescribing authority like pharmacists and medic uh, nurses and doctors as a healthcare professional here. Thank you, Casey. Anne, is that okay if I jump in? Yeah, absolutely, Anne. Okay, and, and Shelly's with me, just so you know. We got counsel, so we're good. Um, <laughs> Thank you. 
the way that the law, so um, the provisions are updating the insurance code and the health and safety code, and it specifically states a licensed healthcare professional may request. Okay. Is it within the scope or to add the word licensed? So it does say licensed. I apologize if I missed that. Thank you. We'll second. Uh, so we had a motion from Nicole. Does anyone want to second the yeah, motion? I had second. Uh, I'll second it. Thank you. Any other member comments? Hearing none, we are ready for a public comment via WebEx. We are open for public comment on 4E as an echo. If you'd like to make a comment, raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star 3 to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And our first request comes from Keith Yoshizuka. Hold on just a moment, Keith. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you. Uh, Keith Yoshizuka on behalf of the California Society of Health System Pharmacists, and we speak in support of the uh, bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. And next we're going to hear from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment, Stephen. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you. Um, I think uh, that KK is right. There needs to be clarification on what it means by healthcare professional. It was noted in, after his comment that this is not a change in the business and professions code. And I think there's some confusion. Technically, anyone licensed under division two of the health and safety code is considered a healthcare uh, professional division two as it applies to pharmacy. In that section, pharmacy technicians are therefore considered healthcare professionals. They are licensed under division two of the business and professions code uh, in the healthcare uh, statutes. And for other purposes, such as mandatory reporter, uh, they are considered a healthcare professional and have to comply with that law. So I think it, it does need clarification. Uh, I think the clarification is easy. It should be uh, someone with prescribing authority um, uh, under federal law uh, changes in prescriptions have to be made by someone by the state who um, has prescribing authority. Uh, they let the states determine who has prescribing authority, but it, uh, under federal law, this would be a violation if it was done by someone who did not have prescribing authority. Uh, there would also be issues about whether it would be actually covered uh, in uh, federal law under Medicare Part D. Uh, um, Pharmacies have already gotten in trouble by violating Medicare Part D by taking refill authorizations from someone who was not a prescriber under either federal or state law. So I think there does need to be clarification. And I think that the staff uh, could work with the author to, to get that clarified. Thank you. Thank you. And those were our only two requests for comment. Bring it back to members for the vote. Um, Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Jose, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. KK, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Maria, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Nicole, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Uh, next, we have Assembly Bill 2269, Flora Board Membership Qualifications Public Member. This bill would reduce the prohibition of a public member of any board from having a specified relationship to an employer, contractual relationship, etc., with a licensee of that board within three three years. It's currently at five years um, of that public member's appointment. I note that staff are not recommending a position, and I agree with establishing that establishing a position is not necessary um, and that staff can monitor the measure. Members, I welcome any thoughts that you have. Yeah, I just wanted to say as a public member, I will be abstaining from any conversation or on any vote just out of conflict of interest thing. Great, thank you, Trevor. 
we don't have any other comments, we can open up the uh, comments via WebEx. We are open for public comment on 4F as in Foxtrot. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of your screen. Dial in users, dial star 3 to raise a hand. And as a reminder, reminder to our mobile device users, if you're having trouble finding that hand button, you may need to hit the ellipses button, that dot dot dot, in order to find the correct page. We're going to take just a few seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes, thank you. Moving on to the next agenda item, Assembly Bill 2271, Ortega, coverage for naloxone hydrochloride. Members AB 2277 would designate prescription and OTC opioid reversal products as a covered benefit under Medi-Cal and health plans. Further, the measure would prohibit plans from imposing any cost sharing that exceeds $10 per package and would prohibit high deductible health plans from imposing cost sharing. The measure would make the provisions effective based on funding for the naloxone distribution project. The measures includes a sunset provision with the provision becoming inoperative when the state reports 500 or fewer opioid deaths in a calendar year. I note that the measure has been referred to Assembly Health Committee, but does not have any hearing date yet. I agree with the staff recommendation to establish a support position. As I open up for member discussion, I welcome your thoughts and would also entertain a motion, including a recommendation to establish a support position on 2271. Yeah, Jesse, once again, I mean, uh, let's all hope and pray that our state gets to a point where we have 500 or fewer opioid deaths uh, a year. And again, just another tool in the toolbox to make sure that we are doing everything humanly possible to uh, save lives during this opioid epidemic. So I move for the board to support Assembly Bill 2271. This is Nicole. This is Nicole. I'll second. Um, I just wanted to make the comment that we just need uh, to totally support it, just that we'll need some kind of process to be able to process those, um, you know, in the pharmacy, like as a prescription, be it like a, a state protocol or, or something that we can use. Um, I don't think that's a, an issue, but just want that noted if it goes through. Absolutely, thank you. Any other member comments? Okay, I'll just add, um, I think we've made great strides as a state to make um, uh, naloxone and opioid reversal products uh, more accessible. Uh, the over-the-counter products are great, but they're very expensive. And so uh, making this as easy and affordable for people to access as possible is absolutely necessary if, if we want people to utilize them. Um, so if there are no other member comments, we can open up for public comment via WebEx. We are open for public comment on the motion. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. And it looks like we've got a request from Keith Yoshizuka. Hold on a moment, Keith. We're gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you, Keith Yoshizuka on behalf of the California Society of Health System Pharmacists. Uh, I speak in support of the bill. Uh, in particular, because it specifies uh, coverage, even if the pro product is OTC, um, several of the drug plans uh, will not cover an OTC product, but this specifically spells that out that it shall be. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And that was our only request for comment. Great. With a motion on the floor, we can um, do a roll call vote. Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Jose, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. KK, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Maria, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Nicole, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Uh, next is Assembly Bill 2445 Wallace Prescriptions Personal Use Pharmaceutical Disposal System. 
AB 2445 would prohibit a dispenser from dispensing an opioid unless it also provides a personal use pharmaceutical disposal system to the patient. The measure provides that the provision only became operational under the legislature enacting a framework for the governing of personal pharmaceutical disposal systems. I note that the measure has been referred to the Assembly Appropriations Committee. I do not believe establishment of a position is appropriate at this time, especially given the unknowns with the framework for governing personal pharmaceutical disposal systems. Members, I welcome any thoughts that you have. Hi, Jesse. This is Nicole. Um, I understand where they're coming from with this, but I again wonder about the cost. If this is something that has to be absorbed by the pharmacy, that's going to be really difficult and logistics. You know, a patient's not necessarily going to want this if they are routinely on opioids. Like, are you going to give them one every single time they pick up? Um, you know, I, I feel like this is one of those things, like if it was forced, a lot of patients just wouldn't use it and would throw it away and it would be very wasteful. So I would prefer if anything, it may be moved to like an offer um, and then obviously taking into account the costs and who, who's going to pay for it. So I think there's some considerations that need to be made on this one. Thank you. I totally agree with you, Nicole. Um, I also, um, just wonder from a practical standpoint, uh, would requiring such thing uh, make it more difficult for people to access their access their opioids if they do um, if they do have them regularly? I don't want to create any barriers to people being able to access their appropriately prescribed medications as well. Any other member thoughts? Okay, hearing none, we are ready for comments via WebEx. We are open for public comment on 4-H, that's in hotel. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. As a reminder to our mobile device users, if you're having trouble finding that hand button, you may need to hit the ellipses button, that's the dot, dot, dot at the bottom, in order to find the appropriate page. We're going to take just a few more seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, you wish to continue? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so for now, I will monitor the measure with staff and bring it back to the committee as appropriate. Uh, okay. Quick interruption. Yep. We had a hand fly up at the last moment. Oh, yeah, we can bring it back. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let's call on Paige Talley. Hold on just a moment, Paige. We're gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone. Um, Paige Talley with the California Council for the Advancement of Pharmacy. And my board met yesterday to take positions on bills. And this was one they reviewed and they were very perplexed by it. And so I agree with you that you need more information on this bill and how it would affect patient use. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And now I believe we're ready to move forward. Great. Uh, so we will continue to monitor the monitor this measure and then bring it back to the committee as appropriate. Uh, moving on to Assembly Bill 3026, Dixon Pharmacy. As introduced, AB 3026 would have sought to amend the board's authority to issue a waiver of provisions of pharmacy law during a declared disaster to 60-day increments following the termination of a declared disaster. Since the release of the meeting materials, staff have been advised that the measure is not moving. Given that, we will proceed to the next measure for our consideration. Assembly Bill 3063, McKinner Pharmacies Compounding. Members, AB 3063 is similar to AB 782 from last year. As a reminder, the board initially established an oppose unless amended position in the hopes that the board could work with the author's office to discuss implementation challenges that some pharmacies may have indicated that would experience as a means to facilitate the policy goal of the measure without creating a conflict with state and federal law and national standards. Regrettably, that did not occur. The primary difference between the two measures is that uh, 
AB 3063 includes a sunset date, meaning that uh, conflict would only exist until January 1st, 2030. Inclusion of the sunset does not address the board's concerns. I note that President O has established an oppose unless amended position, which I believe is consistent with the actions of the board from last year. I believe that OUA is appropriate. Members, I welcome your thoughts on this measure, including if you are in agreement with the OUA position. Hi, Jesse, it's Maria. Uh, and just to kind of reiterate um, past meetings and discussions, this has been uh, discussed quite a bit in the Enforcement and Compounding Committee. And I agree with President O's um, position of oppose unless amended um, because of the conflict with federal law, well, federal uh, standards. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, if there are no other member comments, we're ready to accept public comment via WebEx. We are open for public comment on 4J. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of your screen. Dial in users, dial star 3 to raise a hand. And I want to encourage everyone, if you know you want to make a comment before it's called for, don't be afraid to raise that hand early. It won't get tired, I promise. We're going to take just a few more seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes. Um, since we already have an opposed, unless amended position from the president, no motion is necessary. Um, moving on to Assembly Bill 3137, Flora, Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, this is a spot bill. Given that there's no information available at this time, no discussion is necessary. I will move on to the next measure. Assembly Bill 3146. Asali, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, Healing Arts Sex Reassignment. Members, AB 3146 in its current form would establish legislative intent language indicating that it is the intent of the legislature to enact legislation prohibiting a healthcare provider from providing sex reassignment prescriptions or procedures to a patient under 18 years of age. The meeting materials note that the author, author's office indicated that amendments would be forthcoming. However, as of April 9th, the amendments are not yet in print. I, I suggest that we defer consideration of this measure until amendments are in print. Unless members feel otherwise, I will move on to Senate Bill 966. Hey, Jess. Uh, oh, go you ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hi, hi, Jesse. I actually feel really, really strongly about this one, and I think even without the amendments, we should take an oppose. Um, this legislator is very famously transphobic. This is part of a whole package um, of transphobic bills um, that are happening right now. They even intentionally use outdated language using sex reassignment instead of gender affirming care. So I think the board needs to just take a strong position and I motion that we move to oppose. Second. Um, Jesse? Yes. This is Maria, and I agree with what everyone has said, but I believe that we should follow the policy and the process that we, as a board, have done in the past and to look at all the information once it's available. Currently, this bill really doesn't have anything. It's a one-sentence bill, and so we don't know where it's going to go, and we probably are going to end up with an oppose, but I think that um, we need to follow our process and review the information and then uh, have a, a position once there is information. Uh, one sentence bill is really not even a bill. So I agree with your um, recommendation um, before the motion was there, but your recommendation to not have a position at this point. I agree with Maria. We definitely need more information it, and it may go towards oppose, uh, which is fine, but uh, we, we need to see what cogent argument is made about uh, sex reassignment as it, as the bill reads. I think um, I agree with the comments made by Nicole in that um, opposing this bill is consistent with um, a lot of the initiatives we've taken as a board, including that LGBTQ plus cultural competency CE for pharmacists. 
Um, and since we do have a motion on the floor, we will have to open up for public comments via WebEx if there are no other member comments. Jesse, is it too late to ask a question? Oh, no, go for it. Yeah, are we expect this is for the staff? Are we expected to get more information on this one? Uh, they had original, this is Anne, they had originally indicated that amendments would be crossed. Um, but as of even today, the amendments are not yet in print. They did, um, as indicated in the meeting materials, they had provided information that um, they were um, hoping to, or were going to be including information and the general framework for the measure would be based on the Protect Kids ballot initiative um, that I guess is circulating. I don't know if it's been qualified for the ballot or anything. Apologies, don't know what's happening with that petition. But when speaking with the author's office, they did say that they were using the same framework um, as I understood the conversation as that ballot initiative. And, but and again, it's not in print, so it's hard to say. Sorry, and just adding to that, uh, KK, the, the ballot initiative is very much about ending any transgender uh, medicine and services, banning youth in sports. It's a whole big, very, very, very transphobic initiative. So I feel very confident that this bill will con um, excuse me, continue in the same vein. No, I'm... I'm I'm very comfortable with the opposed position. I have no problem with that. I like to see if there is anything, you know, any, any cogent argument given for that, you know, if if it's just a one one sentence that just doesn't give enough information. But like I said, I'm comfortable with the opposed position. Um, I think we are ready for public comment via WebEx. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise your hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the motion? Yes, please. Okay, so we will take a roll Jesse, call. Before we have a vote, can I just make one more comment? Oh yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to be clear for the record is I totally agree with what Nicole and Trevor are saying, um, but I'm going to be voting no on their motion because I don't think that as a policy, we should be voting on where we think bills will go, but based on just the information that we have. And right now we don't have enough information. But I totally agree with their comments and uh, look forward to, uh, if we don't oppose it at this point, to opposing it in the near future. Okay, thank you, Maria. Any other member comments? For the same reason, I'm going to abstain. Just, okay. just, just would like to see more info. Okay. If there are no other member comments, we'll take the roll call vote. Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Jose, how do you vote? I'm vote yes. Thank you. KK, how do you vote? You said abstain? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Maria, how do you vote? No. Thank you. Nicole, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. And I vote yes. The motion passes. The next bill we have is Senate Bill 966, Wiener uh, Pharmacy Benefits. Members, SB 966 would establish the regulation of pharmacy benefits managers, also referred to as PBMs, within the Board of Pharmacy. The meeting materials detail out the specific provisions, so I will discuss them in detail, as well as the proposed fee structure staff are suggesting to pursue or to ensure implementation is revenue neutral. I also want to highlight that President O, through his delegated authority, established a support position on this measure which is consistent with the board's prior policy on the regulation of PBMs by the board. I appreciate the meeting materials highlighting one of the big challenges facing patients in timely access to medications. I believe PBMs should be subject to regulation in the same manager, manner as pharmacies, including the provisions of Business and Profession Code Section 733. I agree with the position established by President O. Members, I welcome your thoughts on this measure.
Jesse, I guess I'll jump in. Um, I found this very fascinating because it's really a great area of discussion for us. Um, and we may be trailblazers because I'm not sure what other states do in this, this space here. Um, one of my questions would be is, you know, the whole process of an individual, typically our licensee facilities or locations have a uh, associated person that's a, 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 a around that location too. Um, as written, this would provide for licensure of a company or organization, but no person. Um, but uh, that was one part. And the other part was the, um, the ability for the board to look at a unique form of record, looking at uh, uh, these organizations opening their books and records, and the board having the ability to look at financial records and those kinds of things that are business related is, I think, an interesting opportunity um, and an area that the board would need to grow in uh, potentially have new positions like in forensic accounting is a whole specialized area. And so I look forward to how we would implement something like this if it were to pass. I uh, appreciate President O's position of a support position. Thank you, Maria. Um, I will note there are a few states that already do uh, require either registration or licensure through the Board of Pharmacy. Um, so it is, uh, there are a couple of states that already do that. Any other member comments? Hearing none, we can open up for public comment via WebEx. We are open for public comment on 4M, as in Mike. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star 3 to raise a hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. And our first request comes from Stephen Gray. Hold on, Stephen. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this is a very uh, new area in which the Board of Pharmacy is getting involved in, and I agree with Board Member Maria uh, that it is likely to need uh, some clarification. Uh, should there be a designated rep, for an example, like we have with wholesalers and other people, that is an actual person? Um, and also, there's a, a lot of financial uh, talent that's going to need the board to acquire one way or the other. And when they get very involved in these very complex uh, financial arguments, one way or the other, uh, so it's likely to um, take a lot of uh, board resources uh, to comment. Uh, all 50 states have either tried or are trying uh, to do something about PBM regulation. Most of them have not. Uh, nearly gone this far. In fact, I would argue that most of them have adopted things that are pretty uh, benign uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one exception may be uh, Arkansas, which went all the way to the Supreme Court with their law. Um, one of the, I, I generally support this. I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, and But there is one part of it that I think uh, you need to discuss, and that is the bill would prohibit uh, any explicitly any PBM, but actually it prohibits any payer because payers use PBMs uh, to deal with pharmacy networks, uh, et cetera. But it would prevent any payer slash PBM from requiring a pharmacist to have a specialty certification. In other words, it says that they can't require anything other than what the law requires. Several states have already enacted such a law. Uh, but um, it is a very controversial. Uh, also, it would be re prohibit uh, a payer for requiring any pharmacy to have a, an accreditation or a certification, such as one for sterile compounding or a specialty pharmacy uh, certification by uh, UNAC, or not UNAC, um, I'm, I'm thinking of another organization that does that, or even mail order pharmacy or internet pharmacy by NABP. So that would be prohibited under California law, in effect. I think that's a mistake. I think that that could actually, in the long run, uh, be a detriment to patient safety. Uh, not all pharmacists are equally qualified to do everything. Not all pharmacies are equally qualified, equipped, or staffed to do everything or have that record. 
Uh, and so I think that that's one provision that I would like to see the board reconsider uh, because it would really limit uh, the professional practice evolution and uh, uh, measures that would help ensure patient and public safety. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we're gonna hear from Richard Dang. Hold on a moment, Richard. We're gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone. Assist Association, um, uh, as one of the co-sponsors for the bill, we just want to say that we appreciate the board's support position. This is a very important issue for many of our members um, and for many members of, in our profession, as well as for the members of the public as well. So we want to thank the board for its discussion and for its support on this bill as it moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. And there are no other requests for comment. Great. Um, members, do you have any additional comments? Okay. And then since we already had a support position, uh, no motion is necessary. Uh, moving on to Senate Bill 1067, Smallwood Cuevas, Healing Arts, Expedited Licensure Process, Medically Underserved Area or Population. Members, this bill would require the board to develop a process to expedite licensure process for an applicant that demonstrates that they intend to practice in a medically underserved area or serve a medically underserved population. While I appreciate the policy goal of this measure, given how broad it is written, I believe this could apply to quite broadly include a lot of pharmacies. I'm also concerned about the potential impact to individuals seeking licensure as pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, et cetera, and the potential impact on application processing times if the board is required to expedite the applications for those serving in a medically underserved area. The board already expedites applications for members of military spouses and others. And at some point, I'm fearful that continuing to prioritize applications for specific populations of applicants is going to create a barrier for licensure to others. I do not suggest that the board oppose this measure, but I think the board should explore securing additional resources that would be necessary to avoid any potential negative impact. Members, I appreciate your thoughts on this one. Jesse, I haven't had a chance to read the, the full uh, language of this bill. So uh, Anne or staff, can you tell me in the bill, do they uh, define what a um, uh, what a medically underserved area or what a medically underserved population is? So the bill itself does not, but I I do have in the back of my mind that it's maybe defined. I think maybe HK might have a definition, and I think federally there may be a definition. Okay, but it, as to our knowledge, it doesn't refer to a specific statute um, definition of what a medically underserved um, area is. So it, it is referencing a health and safety code section 128552. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm comfortable with no position. I mean, obviously, uh, especially the need for uh, pharmacists in rural areas is particularly great. Um, and I assume rural areas fall under uh, this. Um, but also, I see this as almost, I, I agree with the, um, with the staff analysis and your comments, Jesse, because especially for a uh, medically underserved population, I believe there's populations in every, uh, rural and urban area that would fall under that. So we could eventually just be trying to expedite everyone's licenses everywhere, which I think we should always look to improve our our licensing speed and work with our team on that. But this seems like a very uh, broad way and not as effective way to do that. So I agree with the the goals and I, I of the legislation and what they're aiming for. And I also agree with the recommended position of no position. Great, thank you so much, Trevor. Any other member comments? Hey, hearing none, we're ready for public comment via WebEx. 
We are open for public comment on 4N is in November. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in user style star 3 to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And our first request comes from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you again. Uh, just for clarification uh, for uh, Board Member Chandler, uh, there are well-established definitions in both state and federal law and th basically throughout the United States and uh, with the Public Health Service and others, uh, what is considered a uh, underserved area or an underserved population. And, uh, and it's important to note that the, the distinction or the difference or the inclusion of two different terms, areas and population, uh, as you mentioned, there are underserved areas in rural areas and remote areas, but also in the heart of, of um, uh, some urban areas. And that is particularly applicable to pharmacies because a lot of those uh, underserved areas in, in uh, uh, the hearts of cities and urban areas, there is no pharmacy uh, for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's a uh, economic, maybe it's a crime issue, uh, whatever it is, uh, but this is uh, particularly important to pharmacies. Um, many of those people also do not have transportation abilities, et cetera. So uh, think of it as um, licensing. I think it, it's intended to do licensing for all the licenses given by a Board of Pharmacy. Board of Pharmacy has uh, supported remote site dispensing pharmacies. Uh, as a way to get at some of these issues, uh, at least in the uh, rural areas. So I think it would be consistent with board's established direction and policy to actually support uh, this bill and then work out with the author, um, you know, that you know, implementation may be on the pharmacy side as well as on uh, the personnel side for people who are willing to work in those areas. Thank you for your comments. And that was our only request for comment. Great. Thank you. Um, so since there is no motion on this measure, we can move on. Uh, the next measure that we have is Senate Bill 1365, Glazer Pharmacy Technicians. Members, SB 1365 would update the pharmacist to pharmacy technician ratio to one to six from the current one-to-one -one or one-to-two ratio that's in place. I note that the meeting materials recommend in opposed position. In attending the license committee meeting yesterday, we received the results from the board's recent survey on the current ratio. While many respondents suggested a change of the ratio from one to, to one-to-two, uh, the committee staff uh, has been requested to further extrapolate the data to see what the recommended ratio was for non-manager or administrative pharmacists. Uh, members, I welcome your comments on this and um, entertain a motion if you believe establishing a position is necessary. Hi, Jesse. Yeah, I was in on the licensing meeting as well, and there was definitely a consensus um, that the one to two or one to three range from the uh, surveys that was done, that is the thing that's very important to note that was done by managers and pharmacists in charge. Um, and like you said, they're asking for more non managerial uh, positions so we can get that in there. Um, nowhere, I didn't see anywhere in that survey a, a significant uh, support for any anywhere near a one to six ratio. And so that made that brought me significant concern. The fact that we're talking one to two, maybe even one to three. Um, I noted during the conversation yesterday that there seemed to be a good amount of area for kind of conversation and compromise amongst folks who believe in one end of the spectrum versus the other end of the spectrum. Uh, but one to six uh, seems like it's a pretty uh, out there number that no one's even thinking of. Um, and there's in it from what I have seen, whether it's in the surveys or in the conversations, um, one to six doesn't come across as a very serious number for a ratio. And so, uh, while I think this is a substantive conversation, um, and I hope that 
uh, folks are able to come together and have conversations on a number that makes sense. Um, I would not support um, a one to six uh, ratio. I think that number is uh, is too far out of the mainstream of where the conversation is going. So I would move to oppose uh, Senate Bill 1365. Hey, Jesse, this is this is Nicole. Um, I agree with a, a lot of what Trevor said. Um, my only thought is, is there room for an oppose and less amended position? Um, I kind of suspect that the one to six was like, they know it's going to get amended. So they started really high with the, the knowledge that it was going to be moved. Um, cause you know, like I, I get a, I hear a lot of frustration with a one to one ratio, um, we run into a lot of issues at the very beginning and very end of the day when you're trying to get stuff like up and running and shut down, but you probably only have one pharmacist and then you can only have one tech. And so, uh, and uh, the pharmacist pretty, pretty uniformly expressed that it would be a lot easier if they could have two. Um, so, and, and then I also look at situations like, is there room in this? And I don't know if this is going back to the author, to set different parameters. Are the rules different for a chain pharmacy versus like a closed door, like really large, you know, um, like pharmacy that's um, doing the prescriptions and then sending them somewhere else? Like, are there different areas that look different or have different limits? So um, I don't know if, how we all feel about those things, but I think there might be room for oppose unless amended with us maybe making a few suggestions on what that might look like. Yeah, and in, in, res in response, um, based on my original motion, uh, for me, like if, if this was a one, if they had proposed a one to four or a one to three, I would be much more open to an oppose if amended because it would, it would show that there's a little bit more willingness to um, go to that point. I think in the interest of, um, establishing a firm board position as we go through the results of, uh, especially as we await these results of the um, pharmacists and of the non-managerial uh, professions and the staff. I, I mean, there's always an opportunity to review anything at any time. And I think by having the board as opposed to uh, a ratio as high as one to six, it'll put us in um, a position that's consistent where we've been in the past and allow us to be a part um, and respect our own process and in, in that. So I would still, I'm still looking for, I would hope to have a second on the, the straight oppose um, and hope that it incentivizes an approach where folks are willing to, to come together and find some common ground on this. Overall, I'll second that for you. Can I, can I ask a process question? If we move to oppose now, and something shifts with this and say they do change it to like a one to three or something, we can come back, right? Or is this like a one and done? Yeah, well, we can always change our position at the July meeting, say that something in this measure ends up being changed to uh, a more reasonable ratio, I would say. Um, yeah. I believe that is an option, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, Anne. That's correct, and also consistent with the board's policy in this area. You have delegated authority to the board president to change a position in between me in between meetings as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, Thank that's you. Helpful. Yeah, I, I can feel better with oppose knowing that we we have some movement if something changes. I really just don't. I have nothing to base this on. This is just my feeling, but I don't think it's going to stay one to six. I think this is going to move. So I just don't want to lose our opportunity if it it gets closer to aligning with something we would be comfortable with. And I think we're the best people to come in and provide them with some some like information and guidance. Mm -hmm. Jesse, this is Maria, and um, hearing the discussion, you know, I feel and understand both the oppose and the oppose and less amended um, stances. I think my my question would be is, you know, sometimes it depends on who the sponsor of the bill is, not just the author and what they're trying to do and what we're trying, what message we're trying to send. Um, if we want to send a message of, you know, uh, why didn't you include the board and uh, why aren't we a part of this and don't you respect our process because we have 
uh, already have this on uh, ongoing discussion, then that would be a harder oppose. But if it's, um, yeah, we can work with you, um, jump and jump ahead and maybe get to a one to two or one to three using this as a vehicle, then that would be a pose and less amendment. Um, so uh, I guess my question would be is, uh, this, who is the sponsor? I didn't see the bill analysis, so I'm not sure there was none on file. Um, who is the sponsor of this bill and, and what's their reasoning behind the one to six? Um, and why did they jump so far ahead? Do you have those answers? Don't have those, those answers, maybe staff does. Yeah, hi, this is Anne. Um, in speaking with the author's office, um, I was advised that this is an author sponsored measure. Um, <laughs> and they, um, as I understand it, landed on the one to six based on a review of what's happening nationally and felt like that was a good place to land. Um, I do feel like there's probably room. Um, you know, I think. I think some of the comments talking about the fact that one to six may be a starting. I mean, I'm not the author, obviously. I'm just sharing my thoughts on it. I think that there's probably room. Um, what the other thing that I would say is um, wherever the board, wherever the committee lands and where the board lands, right? Um, at the staff level, we are happy to. Um, you know, convey not just through a letter, but engage with the author's office um, consistent with the. Board's direction and the committee's direction. Well, with that information, I still think that we have an opportunity to either um, play hardball and say oppose because they didn't even ask the board what, um, you know, essentially, uh, if it's an author sponsored bill, they really didn't investigate much, I guess I would say in a nice way. Um, and if there is an opportunity to use this as a vehicle, we could certainly save a lot of time and effort from the board to in, to reach our end result where we hope to be at a one to two or one to three. So um, I'm not quite sure uh, if um, that we can't do a pose unless amended. Um, I kind of want to hear what the public wants to say. Thank you, Maria. Any other member thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm. I, I keep going back and forth, but I I feel like we have an opportunity here to engage with them. So I don't necessarily want to take the hardest line and then have them move forward on this without us and not have our input. Um, so I lean slightly more towards oppose and less amended so that we can engage with them so that we can show them that there's some room to work with us, especially knowing that it's an author um, sponsored bill. I feel like they just lacked context and we can help provide it for them. I guess with the uh, first and the second on the floor, um, Trevor, is there an amendment or do you wanna continue just to move forward with a vote on your oppose? Uh, I'd like to move forward with a vote on my oppose. Um, I, I hear what everyone's saying. Um, this is, it. I think is important to note um, that this is something where us taking a, a no support doesn't end our engagement on this, but it does send a clear message that's consistent with what we've done in the past um, as far as where we stand on the, the numerous long time conversations we've had on this. And so I think as a result of this conversation, we can move forward, we can move forward confidently with a um, no support and while instructing both Anne and I'm sure President Sung will also be involved in this to engage in those conversations with the, the sponsor so we can remain in the conversation but also remain true to and respect our own processes, our own procedures, um, and making sure that our, our voice is fully heard. Because in the end, I'm confident that this um, bill, if it is if it is truly a serious bill, um, and the one to six ratio makes me question whether or not it's a serious bill. Um, I think it's important we we as a board um, show a um, a seriousness with how we take these things in our own processes and procedures, um, and especially in the light of ongoing surveys coming out. So I'd still like to move forward on a on a um, no support um, with obviously this conversation giving an intention to Anne and others to continue the conversation. 
Okay. Sorry, just from a process standpoint, just wanted to confirm. I think that we have the emotion of oppose, and I just want to make sure, Trevor, that that I have my records correct. The motion is to oppose. Correct. Thank you. Any other member comments? Okay. Um, moderator, we are ready for public comment via WebEx. All right. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. First request comes from Keith Yoshizuka. Hold on just a moment. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you for the opportunity. First, I'd like to uh, commend Ann Sodergren and the staff for conducting an excellent uh, survey. Uh, it, it had quite quite a large number of responses. Um, and the results of those res of those responses seem to indicate uh, migration to either a one to two or one to three, uh, followed closely by uh, leaving it to the discretion of the PIC, uh, cautioning that um, the employer could not uh, put pressure on the PIC to uh, increase in the ratio to something that wasn't safe. I think that would accommodate um, Dr. Tivo's comment about uh, you know different types of pharmacies that fall under the PHY de designation, uh, be the closed door pharmacy, infusion pharmacy, uh, and the ratios would be different based on that. As far as the one to six, uh, I can provide some insight there. That's the uh, current ratio uh, in place in the state of Montana. So you can see that it's difficult for them to recruit uh, pharmacists out there, but also a uh, technician is not always a technician. Uh, in the state of Montana, anybody other than the pharmacist that works in the pharmacy is called a pharmacy technician. Could be the stock clerk, could be the cashier, could be the clerk typist. Whereas in California, we have specified duties that carve out uh, who is going to be licensed as a pharmacy technician, you have to be handling the medication uh, in order to be considered as, as that. So my, I, I feel very strongly that this is a great opportunity to work with the author uh, because uh, the deadline for introducing new legislation has passed. But if we can get this bill amended uh, to be consistent with some of the uh, with the results found uh, in the survey, uh, that might. Uh, shorten the time uh, where it can be implemented uh, by almost a year. So I I would recommend working with the author's office, uh, particularly when they find out that you know the measure is going to be opposed by the Board of Pharmacy. That that would wake anybody up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Paige Talley, followed by Richard Dang. Hold on just a moment, Paige. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you, David. Um, I'm not sure where to begin, but I'll start with that every bill has a fact sheet that anyone can get from the author's office. And the fact sheet for Glazer's bill, SB 1365, states that. Um, the NABP recommended that states increase or eliminate ratios. And he, it continues to say, most other states followed the recommendation. Today, 31 states have a ratio of six or greater. Of those 31, 24 states have no ratio at all. So um, my board, is comprised mostly of long-term care pharmacies. And long-term care can include um, congregate living, residential care, along with skilled nursing facilities. 
and um, DDNs and DDHs, a, a whole slew of um, institutions. But we, um, in long-term care, really prefers the one to six ratio. And so we have a support on this bill. And I would urge you to take a, if you're going to take a, and oppose and less amend, take that bill, take that position now rather than later, because bills can move very fast and July might be too late. Um, so I, of course, would like you to take a support of the one to six and for long term care. It's especially critical because. You know, they're closed door and. The pharmacist has to focus on on Mars and MARSs and everything that comes into them and they have to review them and the more technicians they have, the better off they are. And right now, I want you to know that they can have a one to two ratio in law, but that means that everything else must stop on their um, with their work and they they can only fill sniff and ICF um, prescriptions and that's that's unreasonable they they can't do that most of them not my members seconds. anyway so I urge you to take a a position of if you're going to oppose it unless amend take that now rather than later. But I, of course, Fine. want to support. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, next we're gonna hear from Richard Dang followed by Sina uh, Rafua. I hope I said that correctly. We'll get to you in just a moment. Richard, you're up next. Hi, Richard Dang. This time I'm commenting as an individual. Um, so I had, I did have a question about process as well, which sounds like it was addressed, but the question was, can the board still engage with the author's office to propose amendments if the position is strictly opposed? It sounds like, yes, there is a pathway for that. Um, but I think echoing some of the previous comments have already been made. Um, as the board evaluates this bill, I do also want to encourage uh, the discussion to, to, to look at the language. Because as I currently read it, it only applies to non institutional community settings and it does not apply to institutional settings for what is being proposed for the racial change. Um, as we know, in the hospital and the community, there are 2 different ratios that currently exist in California, a 1 to 1 for the 1st pharmacist and then a 1 to 2, sorry, um, for the hospital settings or, or the institutional settings. When you look at your survey uh, that you did, which is amazing, great results, you do see that there was broken up into preferences of ratio for institutional and non institutional. So, just to evaluate that, if there are going to be amendments or further evaluation to see how the board would like to have that ratio applied across those 2 different licensed settings. Um, I'd also want to clarify a comment that was made about the survey results. While there was a subgroup analysis that was conducted on the preference of ratios from the management group with a number of about 800 to 1000, there was a larger uh, survey that was a result that was conducted with about 4,500 results that were collected, which included all respondents, both non-management and management. And when you look at the results of the 4,500 survey responses that were submitted, the large majority do agree that the current ratio is not appropriate. Um, there was a request for a further subgroup analysis of, uh, of the preferences for those in the non Manage, management position to see if there was concurrence with the results found in the management subgroup analysis. Um, but overall, uh, I agree with all the comments that have been made as an individual so far. Um, the current ratio does not seem to be working, and that seems to be a, a common opinion amongst many colleagues. Um, and that's shown in the survey results as well. But at the same time, like was mentioned by previous committee members, a six to one appears to be too large as the majority of the responses in the survey favor a one to two or a one to three uh, ratio. Um, and then just a final comment, as noted in the licensing committee materials for the background of the survey, while some states do have a six to one ratio, it's important to note, as Keith also mentioned, that those states include all pharmacy personnel in that ratio, including clerks and other non-licensed personnel. In California, our ratio only applies to licensed technicians and does not include interns and clerks as a part of that count. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment.
Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Sina Rufua, uh, followed by Jesse Jerwal. All right, Sina, you're up next, and please uh, correct me if I mispronounce your name. Yes, it's Rafua. I appreciate uh, you pronouncing it correctly, and uh, thank you to the board for uh, for having this. I've been a pharmacist now since 2010, and it's my first involvement with uh, with something like this. And uh, I, I'm thank you for your time. I I, uh, uh, I am the PIC now of a home infusion pharmacy in Southern California. Uh, we service from Santa Barbara to San Diego. Um, we are open seven. 365 days a year and um, my interest in um, in this bill is and I have to give credit to uh, uh, to member uh, Thibault I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly and uh, in, in the mornings and in the evenings and through COVID home infusion was really the, the uh, one of the lifelines for our patients to be able to receive their treatments uh, in a timely manner and we are helping facilitate discharge from an inpatient facility uh, to the home. And a part of that is my, my request would be to consider adding home infusion pharmacies, which are a closed door setting uh, and more akin to an institutional setting in that we are providing um, uh, infusion medications and we're both a PHY and an LSC. And as such, I would, I would ask the board to consider either including closed door home infusion pharmacy settings and um, in, in others that are closed door in either not having a ratio. And I only ask that because there are times where, uh, especially during the holidays and when we are extremely busy, that keeping to that one to one and one to two subsequent ratio, there are times we're working until nine, 10 o'clock into the evening. And, and having the balance uh, to do so makes it uh, very difficult to comply with the law. Um, and also serve our patients. Um, and, and just to give you an in-depth sense of what we do in home infusion is similar, it's akin and similar to an inpatient setting where we're mixing IVs in a sterile environment, but we're doing so for a, a, a one week setting, right? So that technician is checked before and after the compound is complete. And that compound for a TPN can take up to an hour for one uh, seven day, uh, uh, dispense of a TPN. So again, I thank you for your time and I urge you to, to consider a one to six is, um, seemingly very large. And, and that is, uh, in my estimation also, uh, uh, way further than I would, you know, in your seats, I would take it, but a, uh, a one to three or a consideration of having home infusion, closed door setting, um, pharmacies. Uh, not be included into the, the ratio. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, next we're gonna hear from Jesse Jawal. And again, feel free to correct me if I have mispronounced your name, followed by Stephen Gray. Jesse, Hi, you're up next. Sorry, this is Anne. Just really quickly, just wanted to, for the record, indicate that chair um, that committee member Serpa lost her connection and is working to reconnect. Sorry, just wanted that on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Hi, this is Jazzy with the UFCW Western States Council, uh, who represents our union represents thousands of retail pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and clerks in the state of California in drug retail and in grocery. Um, our members um, are vehemently opposed to a one to six ratio, um, so much so that we had 96 pharmacists send in letters to the committee in opposition to this bill. Um, one to six is a significant increase in the current ratio. And um, we truly believe that if we're gonna change the ratio, it should be pharmacist led and make sure that we have pharmacists and their input um, at leading this conversation and having them really change the ratio and also make sure that there's the discussion around uh, in addition to a ratio change, do pharmacists feel like there needs to be other protections put in place into the bill, maybe around liability or PIC authority? And um, as you deliberate on whether you should take an oppose or an oppose unless amended, 
UFCW would agree with the staff recommendation and the motion of an oppose um, as a sort of signal that one to six is a significant increase and then be able to engage in discussions. If you do take an oppose unless amended, you will have to offer amendments in your letter of what that position looks like. And the board really has not had deliberations. Um, the survey results were just previewed yesterday to be able to talk about what do those amendments even look like um, and even be able to parse through some of the data in a finer way to figure out what those protections and amendments look like. And so I think for the purpose of this meeting um, would push this board to take an opposed position and it does not cut you off from having conversations with the author's office on what amendments look like when the board does have agreement on what those amendments are and um, go in as a stronger force. Um, I also just wanna flag to be mindful of the unintended consequences. We heard one of the speakers talk about how it's hard to recruit pharmacists in Montana because of the very openness of the ratio. And we don't want to see um, in the pharmacies where we do have two pharmacists and are fortunate enough to have two pharmacists with overlapping schedules, um, see one of those pharmacists uh, be laid off uh, in lieu of hiring more techs because that puts a lot more workforce burden on the one pharmacist that could be there. So I think really taking the time to look at the survey data, um, which is signaling a change in the ratio, but then also to be mindful of what can some amendments look like to make sure that we're protecting our workforce um, and promoting the hiring of pharmacists at a time where we need more pharmacists and not seeing those pharmacists um, actually be laid off in some of the retail settings. Um, so that is what I wanted to, to flag um, and appreciate the survey that was uh, really well done and the discussions that happened at licensing committee and look forward to engaging this board more in the survey as um, the conversation continues throughout the year. All right, thank you. And I believe we got uh, member Serpa back about one minute into that. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to explain I was going yeah. Member Serpa, uh, this is the moderator. Ouch. So, so this Mem Member Serpa, can I interrupt, please? Uh, I'm public. Comment. Uh, I bear with me just a moment, please. Uh, uh, Member Serpa's connection is definitely not all there yet. I've several times, but I think I have a stable. Just a moment longer, please. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is allowable, but Anne, I wasn't sure if um, if Maria does have any comments on this. Um, is there a way for her to submit it via writing or to, to text it for someone else to, to read no. for a staff member, no. or would she have no. to be on the video? Sorry, can you give me just can a minute me? to confer with I'm council? Sorry. Yay, Maria. Maybe that might be an audio artifact. She's still on mute. So Jesse just received confirmation from um, council that Maria can type her comment in and you can read it for the record. Okay. Does that mean I need to open chat for member Serpa? Might I suggest, uh, I apologize, I'm way overstepping here. Would you feel comfortable? I, I apologize because we're in the middle of public comment, but maybe now would be a good time for a break and we can maybe work with um, member Serpa offline and see if we can get her up and going. Yep, um, that is a great idea. So why don't we take a 15 minute break and we can come back here, um, why don't we say 4.05? That work for and for the record, we still have a couple of commenters who wish to 
speak. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll make sure to take those commenters. Great. Hi, right, Jesse, just confirming you can hear me. I can. It's good to have you back, Maria. I had to switch my internet. Hopefully, this is more stable. Okay, it's four oh five. So I'll just do a roll call to make sure that everyone is back. Uh, Trevor, are you here? Yes. Thank you, Jose. Yes. Thank you, KK. Present. Thank you, Maria. Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Here. Thank you, and I'm here as well. Um, moderator, we'll continue with public comments. All right, we're going to continue with public comments, uh, starting with Lindsay Gallahorn. Hold on just a moment, please. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. You'll be given three minutes to speak, and I'll give you a 10 second warning before your time expires. Good afternoon. Thank you. This is Lindsay Gallahorn on behalf of the uh, California Community Pharmacy Coalition. Just want to note um, that we support this bill and really do believe it will go a long way to improve pharmacy workflow and enhance access to medications for patients and um, mentioned this yesterday in licensing committee, but want to note again that the ratio is not a mandate. It is not a requirement that a pharmacy has to have six, six te technicians. It's just an authorization to allow that to happen. Um, so understand that that number <laughs> is high compared to where we are now, um, but are certainly in support of the bill and support of a six to one ratio and just to encourage the board to um, engage with the legislature throughout this process um, uh, as the bill moves. And again, thank the board for conducting the survey, which showed that there is a desire among pharmacists to increase the ratios and um, emphasize we do have the most restrictive ratio in the nation and it hasn't been changed since it was established over 20 years ago. So we do think the time is now um, to make that change. And again, just thank the board for discussing this. Great, thank you for your comments. All right, next we're gonna hear from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment. We're gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a long standing uh, subject and a very important subject. Uh, the previous speaker indicated that the current ratios were set a long time ago, uh, and that is absolutely sh true. They were set in the 90s um, after uh, the requirement was put in uh, for pharmacist consultation to allow pharmacists more time primarily to do the consultation. <clears throat> I also want to correct the record, uh, the statute that uh, established those ratios. It also uh, specifically delegated to the Board of Pharmacy that the Board of Pharmacy can set the ratios in hospitals. And that was a recognition that hospitals are governed by CDPH, they're accredited, uh, they have quality committees, they have uh, stringent oversight by the medical uh, staff and, and so forth. So uh, the Pharmacy Board can set the ratio in hospitals and other institutions. Um, I would like to also encourage that you engage with the author as soon as possible. There was some discussion that maybe uh, the ratio would have to wait to be changed in the sunset review report, which would mean that it would go into the sunset review bill in 2025, which means that the ratio wouldn't change uh, likely until 2026. Uh, so this is an opportunity. There was seemed to be a consensus, not only in the survey, but in the discussion uh, at the licensing committee uh, that the ratio needed to be changed uh, for safety reasons, for the ability of pharmacists to fulfill their duties. There is one thing I'd like to point out, and that is a good thing that happened with the bill uh, AB 1286, I think it is, where um, language was put in the law that says that a person, any person or company uh, can be disciplined by the board for interfering with the professional duties of a pharmacist or a technician. Uh, prior law only talked about subverting the uh, responsibilities of the PIC. So uh, there is additional protection in there uh, if, uh, and, and, and PIC authority even now in the law that wasn't there before uh, to make sure that there is some control over all of this. So uh, I would encourage immediate 
Uh, I want to correct the uh, situation also. Uh, Montana recently eliminated their ratio altogether. So it's no longer uh, six to one as previously was mentioned, but it was eliminated altogether. So there are now over 40 states. I forget the number, I think it's 43, but over 40 states that have no ratio whatsoever. Okay, and thank you very much for our ability to comment. Thank you. And that was our last request for comment. Great, thank you. Um, some members, we've had a lot of public comment. I imagine um, we'll probably want to discuss further. So um, any additional comments from members at this time? Yeah, Jesse, I want to just um, highlight a couple of things and, and note a couple of things. Uh, one, um, confirming that there is consensus amongst many of us, I won't speak for everyone, but um, echoing what was just said, that the ratio, uh, that there should be an update to the ratio, that that's there. Um, and the second piece is also highlighting another commenter um, who stated that if we say um, oppose unless amended, we are going to have to propose uh, what we think the ratio should be and what the amendment should be. And right now, given that it's a six to one ratio, I don't believe that's being proposed in this bill. I don't believe we as a committee or, or even potentially we as a full body um, of the full board are in a place to specifically say, this is the amendment, this is the specific ratio that the board is recommending. Um, and I also want to highlight another commenter who's who uh, was supporting um, the bill saying that the six to one ratio was put in there specifically because they support the six to one ratio. So with all of these combined um, and also agreeing that the board should continue to have a conversation about this bill uh, and be involved in the process, I think it's also very important that we state um, where we are at right now by just going with a straight um, oppose uh, rather than oppose if amended for those reasons. We do not have an amendment that we can provide that would make it acceptable to the board as we would do in any other cases. Um, the ratio is so far uh, above what has been discussed um, and even in the surveys we've seen and we still haven't seen the, the full survey results from the non-management non-pharmacist positions. So for all of those reasons, um, I would encourage us to uh, vote yes on the motion to oppose this bill and, of course, encourage both staff and um, President uh, O to fully engage to see if we can get it to a point where we can bring forth a potential suggestion of amendment of where we think uh, a ratio should be. So I ask folks to vote yes for the motion to oppose. Thank you, Trevor. Jesse, this is Maria. I have just two things. One is I apologize for um, not being connected well and during the before the break, but I did hear almost all of the public comment. One person, I just mid, I missed some parts of it. I, I was falling in and out, but I believe that I can still participate, even though I didn't hear her full comments. I heard most of them, and even um, there was a part there where I was able to hear, but you weren't able to hear me. So I'm hoping I'll be able to vote. Uh, the second part is uh, uh, I'm, I'm starting to lean more towards a, uh, supporting the motion and uh, with the discussion with the author's office. But one of the things that I heard from the public comment that uh, I think would have to be part of the discussion with the author is the, the different pharmacy practices and the differing um, needs and uh, potential having different ratios for different practice settings. I think uh, that may be something that the office could use some education on, particularly since this bill supposedly, I don't, I didn't read it myself, but supposedly does not include acute care where uh, higher ratios are uh, more applicable, but not six to one. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm glad that you highlighted the different practice settings too, um, because that's been such an important part of this discussion. 
um, as well as the survey results. And um, it actually reminded me, I think one of the public comments from yesterday also noted that the, the data that we were presented didn't distinguish between practice settings. So, for example, if there was, um, you know, administration um, and say that there was a support of a 1 to 3 ratio in a non institutional setting. We weren't really privy to whether or not the respondents actually do work in the non institutional setting. And so I think it's appropriate also to to request staff to look at that data further and say, okay, are the pharmacists who work in retail saying that this is what the retail ratio should be and the same for institutional. Um, because those who don't work in that particular setting may not be the best respondents to note on what the appropriate um, ratio would be. And I think it is. It should be part of a larger discussion. Um, I think the accountability and liability issue should also be considered as well as the supervision of the interns and the unlimited clerks that are also in the pharmacy. Um, and yeah, I, I think I would probably agree with the, the opposed position at, at this time. Um, I think we, we need to work as a board and at the licensing committee really needs to work on um, you know, evaluating the survey results further. And one thing I, I, I don't recall from yesterday, and, and maybe we will talk about it further at a different licensing meeting, but I know there was an opportunity for open comments at the end, and I don't think we really discussed on, on some of the, the comments that were received from respondents. So that's something that I would also be interested in hearing. Hi, hi Jesse, this is Nicole. I think my hesitation with going with a s just straight oppose instead of oppose and less amended is that the author will take that as an unwillingness to engage on our part, that that just means there's nothing that they can do that would make us support it. And so in my brain and my understanding of how this works, oppose and less amended tells them like, hey, we'll work with you, but you got to make some changes. Whereas oppose is just like, there is nothing you can do that would make us support it. And my fear is if we do oppose, they don't want to engage with us and this goes through as one to six um unless we feel strongly enough that our opposition will completely shut this down um i feel like opposing less amended opens the door for us to work with the work with the author um and possibly bring up some of these points that there might be value to having different um settings um that you know we really can't do a one to six but we could support something more than what we have because we're not completely opposed to the concept we are just opposed to the specifics which is essentially what opposed unless amended means um in my brain so um that's that'll be my last pitch thank you nicole um are there any other comments? And and also, I just wanted to confirm, Nicole, I know that you had seconded Trevor's motion. Are you still comfortable with that? I didn't second. Yeah, it was me that uh, seconded. I think it's oh, okay. Say. Sorry. Okay. Um, I think either way, we we can definitely have staff um, definitely reach out to the the author's office and. Um, let them know what the, the concerns of the board are, um, but if there are no other member comments, I think we're ready for a roll call vote. So, this is a vote on oppose. Uh, Trevor. Yes. Thank you. Jose. Yes. Thank you. KK. Yes. Thank you. Maria. Yes. Thank you. Nicole. No. Thank you, and I vote yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to Senate Bill 1468, Ochoa Bogan Raw, Department of Consumer Affairs. Members, the final measure for our consideration today is Senate Bill 1468, which would allow a practitioner who is not specifically registered to conduct a narcotic treatment program to dispense not more than a three day supply of narcotic drugs under specified conditions. Similar to AB 2115, I also agree with the staff's recommendation to establish a support position on this measure. Members, I welcome your opinion and would entertain a motion to recommend establishing a position if you believe it's appropriate. 
Jesse, I'm sorry. I just wanted to highlight real quick. The last slide had had the wrong recommended position on it. It said oppose unless amended instead of oppose. So I just want to make sure that it's noted correctly in the record. That Thank slide. Thank you, Nicole. Okay. Can we confirm that, that we do have the, the vote correct in the records? So we do have the vote correct for uh, the recommendation will be to establish an opposed position that will be going forward to the board. Thank you. Okay. So for SB 1468, any member thoughts or comments? I move we support uh, Senate Bill 1468. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion? I, th I thought I just did. Um, I move. Okay. I move to support. Uh, um, I move to establish a re the recommended position of support for Senate Bill fourteen sixty eight. Thank you. Sorry, Trevor. I was having trouble hearing you. My audio is not the greatest. I'm not going to lie. Um, any second? Oh, I go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Maria. Go ahead, Jose. I'll let Maria go ahead. Hi, this is Maria. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and second that um, with the added information that uh, education is always good and that um, this is a common area in um, institutional pharmacy, acute care and subacute care where you have patients transferring levels of service and uh, patients sometimes get caught in the middle because of uh, the quote unquote methadone rule of the old days of has to be through a authorized treatment program and not via a single prescription. And so education and reminders would be certainly helpful. Thank you, Maria. If there are no additional member comments, we can open it up for public comment via WebEx. We are open for public comment on 4P. If you would like to make a comment, please raise a hand by raising that, by tapping the hand button at the bottom of your screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And it looks like our first request is coming from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment. I'm going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you. As mentioned earlier, I strongly support the concept. Unfortunately, this bill um, gives you a little tease as to what the three day rule is all about. But if you read it carefully, it doesn't really implement anything. It says that dissemination of information is required by the boards that regulate uh, prescribers. It doesn't resolve the issues about who actually does the dispensing and is there a misunderstanding. It doesn't resolve the issue of uh, that is not covered in the DEA's rule about uh, buprenorphine because it only deals with uh, Schedule II drugs. Uh, it refers to uh, the schedule to the uh, schedule of controlled substances in uh, California, which the board already knows from previous regulatory discussions uh, years ago that it's important to realize there's differences in the schedules between federal and state. As I mentioned, buprenorphine is schedule three federally, but schedule five in California. Um, it it um, you know do they is there a bona fide patient relationship, uh, which is required by the Ryan Act before the prescriber can authorize uh, the dispensing? Um, so I would encourage, uh, yes, a support, but also um, I think that the author needs help, uh, just like the author of the previous bill that we discussed today on the relative to the same subject, needs help in uh, really crafting the language to really establish a good a three day supply to help patients who are going through withdrawals uh, get into a program. Those patients are highly vulnerable when they go through withdrawals because they've been denied uh, their Vicodin or denied another drug. And what do they do? They go out and find fentanyl. 
And uh, so that's why the DEA is really interested in providing an alternative to the methadone programs, because you just don't snap your fingers and get a patient involved in a methadone program. And, and so it's very important to meet the intent of this to um, really have a conversations with the authors of both bills and get them to come together and uh, help them uh, really design a good program. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And that was our last request for comment. Great. I'll now turn it back to member. Right, See, this you. is Anne. Yeah, we could we couldn't hear you for a moment. Do you mind starting yeah, over? Sorry, my audio was messed up. Um, okay. Um, so we'll turn it over for a roll call vote if there's no member comments. Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Jose? Yes. Thank you. KK? Yes. Thank you. Maria? Yes. Thank you. Nicole? All right, I'm not sure if my audio is connected. Can you all still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, Nicole, you dropped off for just a moment. I noticed that the closed captioning picked up your yes vote. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Perfect, thank you. And I vote yes, the motion passes. So moving on to agenda item eight, discussion and consideration of proposed regulation regulated to the use of digital signatures. Members, the meeting materials detail the re relevant laws related to this agenda item. As indicated in the materials, in April 2023, the board approved a policy statement related to the acceptance of digital signatures. To fully Im implement the policy statement, regulations are necessary. Attachment 2 includes proposed regulation language for our consideration. I have reviewed the language and believe it's appropriate. Members, I welcome your comments on the draft language and would entertain a motion if you believe such action is appropriate. I note that the meeting materials and meeting slide include a possible motion. Hi, Jesse. I move to recommend initiation of a rulemaking to adopt California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1700 as proposed authorize the executive officer to further refine the language consistent with the committee's discussion and to make any non-substantive changes prior to presenting the proposed rulemaking to the board. Great. Thank you, Trevor. I'll back him up on that one. Second it. Great. Thank you, Jose. And if there are no further member comments, uh, we can proceed with comments via WebEx. All right, we are open for public comment on digital signatures. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in user style star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. Now it looks like our first request comes from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment. We're sending you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you. Um, I, th I think it's kind of important uh, that the board committee that is making this recommendation to the full committee can say that they've actually read that regulation that is mentioned in the proposed regulation. So what I would ask you to ask yourselves before you vote, have you read the regulation? Do you know what you're voting on? Do you know what requirements you're putting on all pharmacies and others that deal with anything where a quote signature is required. Uh, if you have not read it, then I would think that you might want to defer this uh, to another meeting uh, where you can have a discussion about what the regulation really says. That's California Code of Regulations, Title II, Section 22003A, as mentioned in what you're about to vote on. Thank you. This 
is Anne. Um, just really quickly, just wanted to ask um, our Reg Council, Jennifer, just to confirm that the regulation section that we're citing is consistent with actually the attributes included in the board's previously approved policy statement. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Hello? There you are. Uh, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Yes, the section that is cited to 22003, uh, specifically subsection A or subdivision A, uh, speaks to the accepted technologies. Jennifer, I think we lost you again. Um, I, th I, I believe that the board policy that the board approved um, that's on our website included the attributes um, that are consistent with the regulation, just asking for your confirmation on that. Yes, specifically the, the subsection speaks to the accepted technologies, the acceptable technologies that align with the board's policy as posted. Thank you. Um, do we have any additional public comment? That was our only request for public comment. Great, thank you. Uh, bringing it back to the board for a vote. Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Jose, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. KK, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Maria, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Nicole, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Agenda item nine discussion and consideration of draft frequently asked questions related to cultural competency continuing education. Members, again, the meeting materials detail out the relevant sections of the law. As indicated in the materials, staff have experienced an increase in the number of calls from pharmacy technicians who were the, for the first time responsible for earning continuing education as part of the renewal process. To assist licensees in understanding the requirements, staff have developed an FAQ that if approved can be made available on the board's website to serve as a resource for licensees. Members, I've reviewed the FAQs and believe they're appropriate. I welcome your comments on the draft language and would entertain a motion if you believe such action is appropriate. I note that the meeting materials and meeting slide include a possible motion. Yes, this is Maria. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make this motion. I appreciate the staff putting this FAQ together. This is a, a new waters for the pharmacy technicians, and they have a checkbox now on their renewal that probably causes a lot of confusion. So the motion is to recommend approval of the draft FAQs related to continuing education for pharmacy technicians. Great. Thank you, Maria. This is something I personally fielded a lot of questions from my own staff. Uh, I think one thing which is not clear is this board providing or going to provide a CE with regards to that. I think that probably needs to be very clear in the FAQ if it's not there. That is a very good point, KK. That's a, a good question that could be included. Um, I think even amongst pharmacists that that is a point of confusion. So I imagine it will also be confusing for technicians. Correct. And I personally feel that at least half a dozen questions from my staff for that. Is there a possibility that we can add that as a question or have staff look into that? Jesse, this is Maria. I'm sorry, go ahead, Anne. I was going to refer them. To or do we, do we think that question two already answers that? I think that's what it was trying to answer. And if it does not, maybe we could ask uh, you to work with staff to make it more clear. But I think that's what it was trying to do. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry, Anne, if I um, cut you off. 
Um, do we have a second to Maria's motion? Second Maria's motion. Okay, thank you. If there are no further comments, we can open it up to uh, comments via WebEx. We are open for public comment on the motion. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And our first request comes from Stephen Gray. Hold on just a moment. We're sending you a request to unmute your microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to comment regarding the question or the comment that was just stated about questions about whether the board is going to provide such a course. Um, the law does not require the board to provide the course. It allows the board to set the parameters for uh, recognizing uh, CE programs provided by other programs as, as long as they meet the requirements of the statute. Um, and uh, I don't think the board has made a decision about whether it will or will not provide a course. I don't think they do at this time, but I don't know that you can answer the FAQ other than to say at this time, the board has not decided to itself provide such a course. So I think that's, otherwise I would just um, approve this going forward and then maybe make that clear uh, in some communication or in the script. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think uh, the board has yet decided to or not to provide a course the way it does for the pharmacy law uh, course that is required. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And that was our only request for comment. Thank you. Bringing it back to the board, if there are no further comments, we can take a roll call vote. Trevor, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Jose, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. KK, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Maria, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Nicole, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Uh, moving on to regulations. Members, all items included in the regulations portions of the report are for information only. As detailed in the meeting materials and associated attachments, the board has several regulations in various stages of promulgation. I do not intend to review each as the information is contained in the public materials. The board's notice to consumers regulation was recently approved by the Office of Administrative Law. Staff is working on drafting final rulemaking documents to regulations that have been adopted by the board. There are several regulations in the pre-review stage, including the board's fee regulation. It is my understanding that the board's fee regulation will be brought to the board for consideration and action based on a recent recommendation from the DCA. Members, do you have any questions or comments on the regulations? Thank you. Hearing none, we are ready for comments via WebEx. All right, we are open for comments on regulations. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise that hand by tapping the hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Thank you. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes, thank you. I'll now bring the discussion back to members. Uh, if you have any additional comments. And if not, before we adjourn today, I would like to thank everyone for your time and participation. Our next meeting is currently scheduled for July 17th, 2024. Please watch the website for updates on this meeting. And I look forward to seeing everyone later this month at the board meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.